Okay. All right, so we're going to learn the halachot. So what you see in front of you is... Oh, wait a second. Oh, the second side of the sheet, not the front side. The second side. The side I, I shouldn't have... I accidentally added also the front side, but I meant to just have the back side that says uh, Zion on it. See this? Okay, I accidentally uh, photocopied the front page that we had finished last time. I forgot. Okay, so Siman Tet. Ilchot all right, so we, uh, yeah, Simantet, we finished Chet last time. Yeah. yeah, so uh, Simantet, we're doing Shulchan Aruch of Hilchot Tzitzit. Eze begadim chayavim betzitzit, veze piturim mitzitziti. The topic of this Siman is which garments are obligated in Tzitzit and which garments are exempt from Tzitzit. And as we learned in last week's uh, uh, Siman, we learned about the wearing of tzitzit, the, the berachot, how you put on tzitzit, when do you have to say another berachah, etc. Okay, now we're learning about which garments require tzitzit. Now you will notice an obvious reversal in terms of how the Rambam presents tzitzit. The Rambam starts with uh, halachot about the making of tzitzit and then he progresses on to the wearing of tzitzit. Although he too has which kind of garments uh, are obligated in tzitzit towards the la- towards the end in the last parak, but he puts which garments are required to to uh, have tzitzit affixed to them before he talks about the berachot of wearing them. That's a different issue. So, but in the Shulchan Aruch, we're up to Siman Tet, and he says, En hayav betzitzit. Now, this should sound familiar to you because this is straight out of Rambam, of course. So, En hayav betzitzit min Torah el abeged pishtim o shel tzemet rechelim. That there are only two kinds of garments that are obligated in tzitzit from the Torah. These are namely a garment of linen, pishtim, and a garment of tzemer rechelim, a garment of sheep's wool. Not any other kind of wool. Don't confuse that with, for example, goat's hair, which is not called in Hebrew tzemer. It's called notza. Notza shalizim. So, uh, so, huh? Because sometimes the word semer is used, equi- what we call equivocally, like we learned in logic, right? Sometimes it's used equivocally, the term semer. So here he's using the term e- semer in the precise way. So in the Bet Yosef he explains, so this is of course the conclusions from the Bet Yosef. So in the Bet Yosef he mentions, this is only semer rechelim, this is only the uh, goats, I'm sorry, the sheep's wool, and not any other kind of wool. His exact words in the Bet Yosef, um... I didn't actually copy because there was, there's so much in this Bet Yosef that it would just be unwieldy to have copied it. So I'm going to read to you from the parts that are relevant as we go through. He says, Whenever I say Tzemer, I mean only Shel Rechelim, only sheep. Um, he says, Because of Al Shel Nitzi, Shel Izim, goats here, Notza Mikre. Okay, so that's what called notes of shell gimalim. Afal bishin nikrat semer gimalim. Vechen semer arnavim. Nikrat semer arnavim. Semer stam lo ikre. So he says, even though we would call rabbit's hair semer of a rabbit, literally wool of a rabbit, we might call a camel's hair the wool of the camel, but the term semer by itself is always referring to sheep's wool. Okay? So therefore, that, these are the only two things. Now, Okay, we're going to explain this in a second. About big day, sharminim, en hayavim, betzitzit el midravanan, any other kind of clothing. You have silk or any other kind of material, cotton, silk, these are the typical ones. These would only be obligated in tzitzit midravanan. Many of the talitot kitanot that you can get, like a talit katan from the store that has, uh, uh, you know, uh, for kids or, you know, the ones that go under the shirt, a lot of times they're made out of cotton. So according to Shulchan Aruch, that's only obligated in Tzitzit Midi Rabbanan. Does that mean you don't say a Baracha on it? Not, no, you still would, even, but you're not fulfilling the mitzvah Mina Torah. You would only be fulfilling the mitzvah Midi Rabbanan. Now in the parentheses, we have the statement of the Ramah, the Ramah's Rabbi Moshe Israelis, who is the, uh, jur- the Ashkenazic uh, view, uh, the Polish uh, rabbi who speaks in the Shulchan Aruch, he says, V'yesh omrim, dechulho chayavin midoraita, v'achi hilchita. According to the Ramah, he is following the tradition of the Tosafot and the Rosh, in saying that actually, no, all, this is a good Chacham uh, Fa'ur could uh, discourse on the history of this, but basically, this is a, uh, a classic Sephardic Ashkenazic split where the Sephardic key Rishonim ruled. In other words, in the Talmud itself, there's a machloket. The machloket is between Rav Nachman and a few other. 
uh, 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 rabbis of the Talmud, including Rava and a couple of others. So Rav Nachman was the one that said that whenever it says Beged Stam, it says the word Beged in the Torah, it means Beged Semer, Beged Pishtim. Either a, a, a garment of wool, a garment of linen. And where do we get that idea from? Because when it talks about Begadim, for instance, in the context of Tumah V'Tahorah, Purity and impurity. It always says, Bebeget semer, o bebeget pishtim. You're going to find, you know, that a beget semer, a wool garment or a linen garment has become tamay, or has, or has contracted sarat, or whatever the case may be. So, semer and pishtim are the stam, the, when the term is used without any qualification, the word beget is a reference to wool and linen, according to Rav Nachman. So he extends that beyond the laws of purity and impurity and says, you know what, that applies even to the laws of tzitzit. That whenever we see, it says, kanfei big dehem, it says that it's on the corners of your garments, that means the corners of your wool and linen garments, just like beged means in other contexts in the Torah. However, Ravah comes along and says, no, that's not true. All bigadim are included equally. This is an egalitarian system. All cl- cloths are equally obligated, so therefore cotton or uh, goat's hair clothing, which is actually very coarse and you probably wouldn't wear anyway, but that's another story, um, or uh, you know, uh, silk clothing, all of these things would be equally obligated in tzitzit, min ha-Torah, according to Rava. Now you have a discussion with the Rambam and the Rif, who are the two amudeh ra'ah. They are the two real primary... Sephardic halachic authorities, they both rule like Rav Nachman. The Rambam, we already learned, says very explicitly that the only garment that's obligated, he says, uh, that the only time you have a mitzvah mi deoraita mina Torah is v'tihi ha-kesut shel tzemer o shel pishtim bilvad. Okay, any time, so he says, however, a talit from other minim, other uh, types of fabric are only rabbinic. That's the Rambam. The Rif says exactly the same thing. Uh, the reason why is because in the Talmud, even though there are a lot of opinions that seem to oppose Rav Nachman, he gets the last word. So that kind of makes it seem like he who laughs last, laughs best, as they say. So he, he wins the argument according to the Rambam and, the, and, and according to the Rif, who is uh, a couple of generations before the Rambam and... Uh, it, pretty much they are aligned, generally speaking, in their analysis of the Talmud. They rarely differ from one another. But the Rosh, on the other hand, and the Tosafot come along and say, no, uh, there are a lot of opinions in the Talmud that say that all bigadim are equal, all garments are equal, there's no difference, there's no uh, special status of wool and linen, and therefore they say that they're equally obligated in tzitzit, and therefore um, don't distinguish between rabbinic and biblical on this. Now, again, it wouldn't be a question of saying a beracha, because even if you're wearing a silk talit, according to everybody, if you're putting on a silk talit, and that's you say the beracha, it's no question. It's equally obligated, and you cannot wear a silk four-cornered garment without tzitzit. The only question is, is it rabbinically obligated or biblically obligated? Okay, that's all. Now, why would it be that the Torah singles out? Now, one question we can ask is more of a philosophical question. It's not a strictly uh, halachic question, is why would we come to that conclusion? Rav Nachman's conclusion is a little bit unusual. Why would we have the conclusion? Why would we have the idea that only wool and linen garments should be included in the mitzvah? On the surface, it's difficult to uh, comprehend why the Torah would establish certain bigadim as the premier bigadim. Wool and linen. Other bigadim, they are secondary. They are not as significant. It's a little bit strange. Um, It requires explanation. So some say because of the juxtaposition between tzitzit, the mitzvah tzitzit, and the mitzvah sha'atnez. It says you can't combine wool and linen together. And then it says, wear tzitzit, uh, right after that. So that shows you that, oh, the same garments that were spoken about in the previous pasuk, in parashat ki that's what it's talking about when it says to make tzitzit on your garment. But still we have to ask. That's just random. That's just a juxtaposition. I mean, what's the reason why wool and linen garments should be singled out from among all other garments? Obviously, we can ask this question not just about hilchot tzitzit, but really we can ask this question about tuman tahora as well. Purity and impurity. Why are uh, wool and linen garments singled out? Why is it that in shatnez only wool and linen garments are singled out? And uh, only those you're not allowed to mix. Why am I allowed to mix silk and cotton and everything else, but I can't mix wool and linen. What's the reason? So 
it's possible to uh, to understand that. And I'm just putting out a speculative theory. I'm not putting out a definite, absolute interpretation. We don't really know a lot of times the Tamei Mitzvot. We can only speculate and, and theorize about what the reasons are sometimes. But one approach that might be correct that might be correct, is that Semer and Pishtim, that the wool and, and linen are representative categories of their, their classes. In other words, that wool is kind of like the premier example of a garment made from animal source, from an animal uh, source. And, and Pishtim, linen, is like the premier representative garment that is made from a vegetable source because it's made from flax. So basically you could say that in a way they're representative. In other words, the Torah doesn't necessarily need to apply its halachot to every single case. It applies the halachot to the two key examples of each category and the idea is conveyed because the purpose of the mitzvah is to teach you certain things, to inspire you with certain ideas. So by taking the two categories that are sort of, so to speak, or the two examples one from each category as a representative, it gets the point across basically. Just like mixing shatnez. Why is it that I can mix, I can't mix wool and linen. One is animal and one is plant. The Ramba, Ramban has a beautiful, there's a beautiful Ramban actually about the idea of shatnez and kilayim mixing different seeds, mixing different species of things. Very interesting. But the question always comes up, okay, you can't mix wool and linen together. Why can you mix uh, goat hair with cotton? It's the same thing. So the answer that I would say is the same idea, that the Torah takes an example, it legislates about the example, and you get the idea. It's, the purpose of the mitzvot is not to cover every single case. You're not allowed to, to for example, mix goat hair with... You're allowed to. You're allowed to. Right. So, how, how so in other words, if the, Torah, if the Torah wants to teach you the idea that you should separate between, that you should make a distinction in your mind between, you know, animal and vegetable, between the, like the Ramban says, the reason is to show you that, there were, that Hashem created different spheres. There's, you know, there's Bale Chaim, there's, you know, there's right, uh, so, Tzomeach. So, so by teaching you in one example... That, that gets the idea across by limiting one. The Torah doesn't go so far. It doesn't apply to other things. Right, it doesn't apply to other things. No. But it teaches you the idea. In other words, the idea is a general idea. So it's, it would be like Shabbat, we only observe once a week. Even though the, the idea of Shabbat that Hashem created the world is true every day. But the Torah doesn't say never do any work because you, you, know, uh, you have to remember Hashem created the world. It's, it's one day is enough. Or Yitziat Mitzrayim, don't eat chametz your whole life because you have to remember Yitziat Mitzrayim every day. Okay, we don't go that far. Just one week. So the, so the same concept. The Torah takes two examples, wool and linen, and says, okay, by telling you that you can't mix wool and linen, I'm teaching you the idea that the, there's two different spheres. There's animal and there's vegetable. Now, I don't have to teach you that by blocking you from mixing it in every single case. I just have to teach you through one case. So the same idea is when it comes to garments. The Torah gives you a mitzvah about garments and says, okay, the idea of tzitzit, I'm going to legislate it in the two signature examples of garments. The, the wool garment and the linen garment. The concept is not alien to the other garments, but the Torah doesn't legislate it. The Torah says that the point of tzitzit gets across through wool and linen. Now the rabbis come along and say, we're going to extend that to all garments in order to strengthen and reinforce the idea of tzitzit. But really, just the fact that I can't wear a wool garment without putting on tzitzit will teach me that lesson of tzitzit enough. Just the fact that I, that I need tzitzit on my linen garment will teach me the idea enough. I don't need to have it on every type of garment. So I, that's how I interpret it. In other words, the biblical law, according to the way the Rambam is understanding it and Rav Nachman in the Talmud is understanding it, is that the Torah takes two key examples and legislates only in these two cases. And then you, get, and then you internalize the idea. The rabbis came along and extended it to all the different types. Ravat in the Talmud, who's followed by the Tosafot, says, no, the Torah actually was indiscriminate about this and said all cases, all garments are going to be included. So that's the machloket, but in the final analysis, it comes out to be the same, that we have to put tzitzit on all garments that are four-cornered, and it doesn't matter. It's just a question of which is biblical and which is rabbinic, which is significant if you want to fulfill the mitzvah. Because if you want to fulfill the mitzvah, you want to do it the biblical way. Not the rabbinic way. Because you want to get the full credit, so to speak. We'll see that in a second. Can I back real quick? Yeah. Has, he, has he been taking the Sephardic perspective? Is that for that reason? That it's like, Say again? Does the Hasidim all take the Which Hasidim? The Chabad or everybody? All Hasidim, as far as I've seen. What, they follow the wool? Never, they, yeah, always wool. Probably they're being machmir. That makes sense. Okay. Why wouldn't you? No, I, I'm just so Yeah, I mean, uh, why wouldn't you? Yeah. 
Yeah, so, so, so the next sa'if gets into a different issue, which is not what kind of garments, but what kind of tzitziot. Because remember, you have to deal with fabric twice. You have to deal with what kind of garment, and you have to deal with the strings in tzitzit. So he says, tzitzit shel pishtim shel tzemer rechilim, potrim bechol minei begadim, so the Shulchan Aruch says that when it comes to the strings, again, we have this distinction that wool and linen strings can exempt any garment. So if I happen to buy a silk talit, I like the look of the silk, it's shiny, it's nice, it's rabbinically obligated in tzitzit according to the Shulchan Aruch. But I want tzitzit that are, I don't want silk tzitzit that's not going to be, you know, easy to work with, silk tzitzit are hard to work with, so I'm going to get myself wool tzitzit. No problem. Wool can cover another garment. I have, let's say I have a cotton talit, because let's say wool is too heavy, it's the summertime, and I, I live in a very hot climate, I want something lighter, so I get a cotton talit, but I, uh, I want to have tzitzit on it that are better quality. Cotton maybe isn't as good quality, so I want to get wool tzitzit. Fine. Wool can go on anything. Pishtim, linen tzitzit also, linen strings, can be affixed to any type of garment as well. These are the two, so to speak, objectively qualified uh, materials. They are always good for anything. However, the only thing is you can't switch each other. Right. In other words, you can't put wool on linen. You can't put linen on wool because of shotness. Now, that wouldn't have always been the case, but it is the case today. In the times of the t- uh, when they had te- when tehillet was being used, okay, so now you're going to get into this whole discussion of tehillet. I don't want to go with it, go there today, but the Shulchan Aruch is operating with the assumption that there's no tehillet. Okay, right. So right, so he, he's operating that with that. So bazman says delekat tehillet meshum kilaim. So in those days, there was no way you could have a linen talit without shatnez. It was impossible. Why? Because the because the tehillet string must be wool. Must be wool. The definition of techelet is a wool string dyed blue. Not a linen string, not a cotton string, not a silk string. So no matter what type of talit you're wearing, if you have techelet, you are going to have a wool string attached to it, a wool blue string. So that means that there was no way to avoid shatnez in those days uh, if, you were, if you had linen talitot around because you would have to put a wool string and if you're going to put a wool string anyway for the blue, what the heck? You might as well put all the strings wool. That also means that tali were meant to be wool originally. Why? Because no, there's a special thing that it overrides uh, shatnez. It's always a positive. Is it, it overrides it. Even at night? That right after it says that you can't have shatnez, it immediately says tzitzit. So the, the same thing as the big day kihuna, Mr. Kohen. The big day kihuna have shatnez. Right, right. Right? right? So what are you going to tell me? That Hashem didn't know about what the big day kihuna were going to be? No. It's on purpose. Because basically the big day kihuna now can't be worn unless you're doing the avodah. Because, you know, it's shatnez any other time. It's only it only overrides shatnez when you're wearing it for the mitzvah. But the talit is in shatnez at night. You have to take it off. That's the problem. That's the problem. So, and, and in fact, we saw that in the Rambam. The Rambam says you can wear tzitzit at night, but the problem is that in matilin batechelat. So when you had that midirabanan rabbinically, they came along and said really biblically, even a linen talit you would put techelet in it because it needs to have techelet and it has to be wool and you have no choice. However, they said the rabbi said no because you're going to forget you're going to wear it at night and when you're wearing it at night you're getting the avera of wearing shadnez but you're not getting the mitzvah. That's the problem. Okay, it's the same thing as the Big Day Kehuna. If the, if the Kohen wears the uh, Big Day Kehuna when it's not time to work in the Beit HaMikdash, he is wearing Shatnez for no reason. So that was the problem. So now what we're going to see is that some rabbis took this even further and basically said, don't even ever have a linen talit at all. But the basic halacha is not that way. The Rambam says just that we don't put techelet in a linen talit because since during the day, it's no problem. You're wearing the linen talit. You have the techelet, it's a wool, it's shatnez, no problem, it's a mitzvah, it's tzitzit, it overrides shatnez 100%, it's no problem. But it's ase, dochelot ase. The positive mitzvah overrides the negative. However, night you're, you're hanging out, you're sitting, you come home from work, you sit down to dinner, you start eating, you, for, you don't remember that you're wearing a tzitzit, and all of a sudden it's nighttime and you're wearing a shatnez, you're not, there's no mitzvah tzitzit at night. But the, the rum doesn't asur wool tzitzit? On what? On linen? No, he means, he means you can't. You can't. 
have you can't have wool on the linen, right. even the techelet wool, which, you oh, know, meaning, yeah. meaning even the techelet wool, for sure not the other ones. Right. For sure not the other ones. So, yeah, and that, that's what he explained. He said that basically um, the Rambam had said that you could actually even reverse it. In other words, in the times where they were practicing, really in theory, biblically, not only could you put wool tzitzit in a linen garment, since the linen garment needed it anyway for the techelet. So once you're putting wool in your linen, what's the difference if you have one string or uh, four strings? The, not only that, you could even put linen strings in a wool garment for, t- for, uh, for tzitzit, even though you don't need it. Because the wool garment, you could just put the wool all wool. You could put the white strings wool. You could put the techelet wool. You don't need any. You don't need any linen. But once, to, once basically shatnes is overridden for the sake of tzitzit, it overrides it altogether. So that's what the Rambam had said. So he says um, that uh, he said that uh, really it should be allowed because you're allowed to, because. But but he says that. Since you're allowed to, really in theory it would be okay, but since for the wool you can fulfill the mitzvah without the linen, we don't have you do that. Okay, in other words, in principle, really you'd be allowed to put linen tzitzit in a wool garment. But since you don't have to for any purpose, you don't. When it comes to linen garments, you do have to put wool in if you're going to put in techelet. You have no choice. And once you, okay. Once you put together, you, you might as well put it the rest wool. It doesn't make it any worse. The only thing is, the rabbis came along and said, "Don't do it because we're worried you're going to forget." So it turns out that you never, we never basically lema said we never put shatnez in our tzitzit, even when you have to chel. Right. Right. Exactly. Okay. So that's what he says, and he says v'yesh omrim. So the haga, the rama says v'yesh omrim. Some say shelo lasot tzitzit shel pishtim klal. He says, some people say, don't ever make linen tzitzit at all. Now, the, the Bet Yosef has a whole long discussion here about exactly what he means. Well, don't make linen tzitzit at all. And what is this opinion really saying? Um, so the way that the, uh, the, way that the uh, Bet Yosef understands it and the way that the Rabbah seem to understand it are slightly different. Um, because the, the Bet Yosef brings down the original source. And in essence, he concludes that really what the halakha was, that you're allowed to put, that, that even though a, a linen garment shouldn't really have, you know, you should be able to put linen tzitzit in it. It shouldn't be a problem. You can't put any other types. So you're stuck. Because linen and wool garments can only have linen or wool tzitzit in them. No other ones. So when you have a linen garment, your only choice is linen tzitzit. That's it. You can't have wool, obviously, and you can't have any other type. So you're stuck. So Rabbeinu Tam and some of the Ashkenazic rabbis had a tradition that we don't put any tzitzit in a linen garment. You could wear it without anything. Okay? They didn't want you to put it at all. Why? Because they were worried you might come to put wool. And so as an extension of that, the Bet Yosef says in his explanation of it, although he doesn't bring it down as halakha, in his explanation of it, he says, therefore they didn't even want you to make linen tzitzit either because you might end up putting it in a wool garment. In other words, just like they didn't want you to make a linen talit because you might end up putting wool in it, they didn't want you to make linen tzitzit because you might put it in wool. So therefore, they ended up with this custom of not ever having linen talitot and not ever having uh, linen tzitzit. Or wearing a linen talit without even putting anything on it. That was what Rabbeinu Tam said. Rabbeinu Tam said it's completely exempt. The Gemara talks about not putting techelet in a linen garment, rabbinically, for the reasons we said. Because it's nighttime, you're going to forget. Okay? It's a gezerah, you might forget. But the Rambam says you put tzitzit in it, just not the techelet. Rabbeinu Tam said, no, no, when it says patur, it means legamre. You don't even put in uh, tzitzit at all. You just walk around with the four-cornered garment of linen with nothing. Even though midioraita, you're obligated to put in tzitzit. The rabbi said, we're too worried. You're going to end up putting in wool tzitzit. You're gonna... They said, forget it. Just don't do it. How can you get rid of a... They can tell you to not do a positive mitzvah. So that's the answer. On Rosh Hashanah, how can they say don't blow the shofar? So that's uh, the answer tell you for, the yeshi- for the yeshiva basketball uh, uniform problem. Oh, why? Wow, what was that? There, there always, there, there's always a concern about the basketball uniforms being uh, being for. Oh, because it's for because they're sl- cut they on the sides, right? They're oh, cut. So they're just made, but they're made of. What are they made of? Seat, seat. 
But they, the way they could do it is if they, if they made, they a, made them out of linen. Yeah. Right. Is a niche market for you to make. There you go. Yeah, it's a good idea. Yeah. Come, first, you have to, first, you have to popularize this Qumran and make everybody worried about it. <laughs> then you open up the business. You understand? That's how it works. You can't, you, if you do it now, nobody knows yet. You have to get some big rabbi to make an announcement that anybody who doesn't do this is in big trouble, and then you make a product. That was like my, th- what I wanted to do, like 10 years ago, I was talking to some friends, I'm like, what we should do is come up with a test of your water that tells you whether it has any gluten in it for, for Pesach. <laughs> because who knows if maybe somebody dropped some bread in the reservoir, you know. And I was playing around, and, you know, but I was saying, you know, I'm, I guarantee you people will buy it. They'll buy anything that they think is a Chumrah for Pesach, they're, they're going to buy it. You know, people buy these huge magnifying lights for checking for bugs that, you know, probably have more uh, radiation. They probably, probably give you, you know, God knows what machalot, you know, from using it, but they, but they, for checking for bugs, you know, so, they say, so they'll do it. So I was like, oh, this is a great idea, you know, because I was always wondering, how come they haven't told you yet that you're not allowed to use tap water on Pesach because there's no, there's no OU on it, you know, it's, people are crazy about it. But then, I, but then I, was, I was undermined because what happened? Somebody decided that there are bugs in the water. So they needed a filter, you know, in New York with all these filters. So I lost my business opportunity because that was all year round. So whoever made up the, made those filters, he got to make a killing. I lost my entrepreneurial well, entrepreneurial opportunity. The filters won't filter out Hamid's residue. That's true. You the still bucket. might you well, still well, might need well, it. In the residue, so the residue is still, you're ma- you still might, It's a mashahu because it's a mashahu. You're right. Because it's a mashahu even. Right. You're right. Exactly. Right. You're okay, so maybe we can bring it back. We have to work on that. We have to work on it. It's a good business. Well, Believe me, with the Persian, whatever, whatever, we, whatever we sell uh, for one Pesach, we'll make it. Don't give up. It could be good, bigger than Google. One. Yeah, <laughs> probably the Chumra Google. They come up with every Chumra. You publicize, you know, a book of different Chumra. All you need to do is publish it one time. Everybody will believe that they have to follow all of them. It's no question. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then once you do that, you, then you market products for all these things. Amazing. You'll, you'll be set. Okay. So, that's just, uh, you, see, you see, even get business advice from the... Uh, no. yeah. So, um, Rabotai. Yeah. Yeah. So the, uh, so the, so, okay, so that's what he brings. So he brings a couple of different interpretations for what is this thing about not putting uh, uh, linen tzitzit in any kind of garment. Why is it? So it turns out that making linen tzitzit uh, is a, they were concerned that if you make the linen tzitzit, he says, um, that Rabbeinu Tam came with this idea of not making linen talit, at, not putting anything in a linen talit, okay, even linen tzitziot. And then he says, "Aval tzitzit shel pishtim, poter b'shaminim kedino." Lekach katav miu nachon nizayr shelo lasot tzitzit shel pishtan afilo betalit shel sharminim. In other words, why don't we want to make tzitzit of, of linen even in other types? The reason is the haish dil ma'atel hatil tzitzit betalit shel pishtan because then maybe you're going to come either either obviously you might end up coming to put them in wool uh, garments or you might end up putting them in. The linen garments where you're not supposed to put them. In other words, it's all part of this idea that we don't do the linen anymore. We don't do linen anymore, so we don't do linen garments with any kind of tzitzit, and therefore we don't make linen tzitzit, which are generally designed for linen garments, and might also be accidentally used for wool. Obviously, that's a separate case, although he doesn't mention that here, but that's certainly also true. Okay, so, tzitzit shel sharminim. This is Saif Gimel. Now notice, did the, did the Shulchan Aruch endorse this idea of not making uh, linen tzitzit? He did not. Okay, that was only the Ramat. Tzitzit shel sharminim. En potrin al baminam. Kigon meshi lebeged meshi. V'temer gevon v'temer gefen. Aval shel al baminam in potrin. Another rule is, we learned earlier, we learned in the Rambam, this very halacha, that you have this dichotomy. Wool and linen are like O-type blood. They are the universal donor. If you have wool tzitzit, you can put wool tzitzit in a cotton garment. You can put wool tzitzit in a, in a silk garment. You can put wool tzitzit, obviously, in a wool garment. But let's say you have cotton tzitziot. Cotton tzitziot are only acceptable for a cotton talit. Wool, uh, I'm sorry, silk tzitziot are only acceptable for a silk talit. They are sub, they are relative to their garments. In other words, you could look at it this way, that wool tzitziot have objective status as tzitziot. All other fabrics of tzitziot are only relative. They have to be matched to their garments. If they, if it's a silk talit, it can have silk tzitziot or wool. Or linen, really. 
Okay? If it's a cotton talit, it can have cotton tzitziot or wool or linen. But cotton tzitziot cannot be put in a silk garment, even though they're both only rabbinically subject to the mitzvah of tzitzit, according to the Shulchan Aruch. The mitzvah is that they can only have tzitziot of their own type or of wool. They can't have one of the other types that's not wool. Does everybody get that idea? Okay. So cotton can have, have either cotton or one of the two objective types, wool linen. Um, silk can have either silk or one of the two objectively valid types, wool or linen. That's the basic halacha. Now, so if dalid im hetil betalit shel sharminim ketzat sitziot. This is a very interesting case that the Beit Yosef brings in this commentary and leaves as a question. Excellent question. I'm going to leave you to tell me what the problem is that he's trying to deal with here. Im hetil betalit shel sharminim ketzat sitziot mimino. He says, let's say a person did as follows. They have, now it must be talking not about a wool talit, because a wool talit can only have wool tzitziot. A linen talit can only have linen tzitziot, and according to the Ashkenazic custom, we don't even use ever, ever a, a linen talit. But let's say a wool talit it can't be talking about. So let's say it's talking about a cotton talit, the person has a cotton talit. And what do they do? What are the two options that we use for a cotton talit? Cotton or wool or linen. Either cotton or wool or linen. So what if what they did was, they said, you know what, I've got three sets of cotton tzitziot, I don't have number four. You know, I can use wool, no problem. So I'll take my cotton talit, three of the corners, I put cotton, and then the last one, I have some wool tzitziot, I'll put that on, they're all kosher for uh, cotton, right? Semer, wool is kosher for cotton, cotton is kosher for cotton, silk tzitziot, can't use those because they're not kosher for cotton. Linen, okay, I want to be machmir. I'm not going to use linen tzitziot. I'm going to be very religious. I'm going, to follow, I'm going to follow that custom not to use it. Okay, so now what, so the question is, is it good? So it says, yes, let's take a It's a question. I'm not sure if that's good. Maybe you have to do one or the other, right? Pick. Either you're using tzitziot shel tzemer, either you're using the wool tzitziot, or you're using the cotton, but you can't. Mix and match, in other words. It's not like one from column A, one from column B. You know, you can't, you can't do that. It's got to be one way or the other way. So what, what is the, what's the question? What, what's the problem? So in other words, the, the simple way of looking at it is, oh, it's, it's, look at each uh, case. I mean, what's the, what's the difficulty? Each, each tzitziot, you know, each set of tzitzit that I affixed to this garment was kosher for the garment. Because it's kosher. They're, they're in groups. Okay, so one possibility, in other words, the question is, do we look at each corner? In other words, or do we look at the whole, do we have to have, in other words, one definition that we're using for the entire garment? Or is each corner uh, evaluated independently? So if I look at each corner independently, okay, this corner has wool tzitziot, is that good for uh, cotton? Sure. This one has cotton. Is it good for cotton? It's also good. Okay, no problem. I don't have to have one definition that I'm working with for the entire baguette, for the entire garment. I just have to ha- make sure that both types are kasher. In other words, I have two options here. I have two options. I can mix and match. No, they're, they're both acceptable. Or do I have to, it, does a garment have to be tzitzitified according to one or the other definition? either using the objective type of tzitzit, the tzemer, which is the universal tzitzit of wool, or its own particular tzitzit, which would be the cotton tzitzit that, are, that work only for cotton garments. But I can't use on each corner a different one. I can't just say, oh, well, they're all kasher for uh, cotton, so therefore I can mix and match. That's the question. Can I mix and match or not? Yes? Don't the objective at least fill, fill the subjective? So therefore you could say the whole thing is subjective. That's a possible way of looking at it. In other words, I agree. One way is to say, one could argue that they're all, that semer is even better. Semer is like the universally good and cotton is particularly good for this case. So what's the problem? In total, doesn't every corner of this garment have tzitziot that are acceptable? Of course it does. This is no problem. On the other hand, they could say that no, these are two different frameworks. Either you affix tzitzit according to one framework or the other framework. But you can't take the two frameworks 
and combine them? That would be the question. The question would be whether what the, the, whether basically there are there's a pool of choices of what you can use for cotton and you can just mix and match, or whether there are two different frameworks, so to speak, and you either have to affix tzitziot according to one or according to the other. They're both valid, but they're not just, it's not just a matter that the halakha identified, oh, either cotton or wool is good for a cotton garment. And they're all the same. They're all lumped into the same category as things good for a cotton garment. In that case, you could use either, you could mix and match. No, it doesn't work that way. It works that there are two different ways in which you can affix tzitziot, either according to the rule of tzemer upishtim, or according to the rule of going according to the particular fabric that you're working with. But you can't follow two principles at the same time. And they're two different frameworks. So that's, really, that's the question. Okay? So he says he doesn't know. So since he doesn't know, not recommended, as they say in the, as they like to say in the rabbinical business. You know? Okay, next one. Say, if hey, yesh omrim, shetzarich lasot tzitzit mitzeva hatalit. There are some who say that you need to make the tzitziot according to the color of the talit. And those who are particular about fulfilling the mitzvot properly are accustomed to do so. Now the, the Beit Yosef brings an opinion here that he brings a very lengthy discussion about this and about the upcoming point even longer um, uh, fleshing out this subject. Basically the Rambam, the, the Talmud is again not 100% clear on this issue. The Rambam is uh, the, the Rambam takes the position that uh, as we learned if you have a it's in uh, where is it? Yeah, so he, in Perek Sheni, the Rambam said, Talit shikula aduma o yiruka o mishar tzivonim, that if you had a talit of red or yellow or whatever the color is, so osechu te lavan shelak in tziva. So you make the white strings, in other words, the ones that are not techelet, you make according to the color of the garment. So if you're wearing a red garment, you make them red. You'll have red and blue. You'll be very American. You know, very, if, you, if you have uh, yellow, you'll have yellow and blue. Right? And so on. Um, he says, uh, so, so basically it seems pretty clear that, the Ram, that according to the Rambam, you have to make your tzitziot match your talit. It's not a fashion statement, it's a halakha. What if your garment is multicolored? So he says, shekula aduma. The most of it. Right. So, so, the, so it means that the primary color is red. What if you literally measure out and make it have that? Half and half. I I don't know. That's that's a good question. That I, that's one. That's the halachic reason. There might, there's also probably a kabbalah reason. Yeah, but but the halachic reason why the the talit the all white talit is preferred is because it gets around this problem. That since the Rambam says that you should make your tzitzit the color of the talit, therefore they make the, the tzitzit, they, since they're going to use white tzitzit, they use a white talit. Now, the, now, he doesn't say that it has to be absolutely white every single... He doesn't say that people have to wear monochromatic clothing. Monochromatic talit. Because he doesn't say, oh, you can't have even like any colors in your talit. He says, if it's kula aduma. If you wore an all red talit, or an all brown talit, or an all any color talit, then the tzitziot would match it. He doesn't say that if you have a white talit with like a black stripe on it, that that means that it's now you have to have tzitziot that are white striped black that look like Snoopy. He doesn't say that. Right? He said. So the Shulchan Aruch says that Yeshom Rim He says that a that that you should do it. Now he brings an opinion that says the Rambam is not telling you that you have to make the tzitziot the color of the talit. He's saying that osin. He said, "What's the exact word? Osechu telavan shalak entiva." You can, you can do it. In other words, he's telling you you're allowed to. But the Bet Yosef points out that that's not really a good argument. Because what, is, what does the Rambam then say? Then he says, but if, what happens if you have Korach's talit? You have the all blue talit. So he says, then you can't do it. Then you make them white. Because you can't have blue, 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 blue. You have to have the contrast between whatever your color is and the techelet. So if you had an all techelet talit, you would have to contrast it by putting in the white. So he says, so the opinion that the Rambam, I'm sorry, that the Bet Yosef brings says that that shows you that that's the only halachic thing, that you can't have blue strings coming from your talit because it won't be distinguishable from techelet. 
But not that you have to, if you haven't read Talit, it has to be read, just that it can be read. But the Beit Yosef says, if that's the, if that's the issue, then why doesn't the Rambam start with that halakha? And say, if you have an all blue Talit, don't make all the strings blue. But if you have other colors, you can use the color of the Talit to match the Tzitzit. That would be the logical order. If it's not required to make the tzitziot the color of the garment, then the first thing you start it with is the thing that is required. Namely, that you can't make blue tzitziot if you have an all blue talit. And then he should go on to say, but if you have a red talit, it's okay. It's okay, right? Instead, he starts out by saying, if you have a red talit, you make the tzitziot the color of the talit. He starts out with that, meaning that that's the requirement. And in fact, the Gemara does sound like that. And Rashi's interpretation of the Talmud is that as well. And the Rif's interpretation, the, the, the Al-Fasi code also brings that as well. It's just that some other interpretations, such as Tosafot, and again, it's very similar Sephardic Ashkenazic breakdown, where you have Tosafot, and the Rosh saying, ah, oh, you don't really need, uh, you don't really need the, the, to match. And then you have the Rambam and the Rif saying, yes, you do. And the Beit Yosef says we follow it. When it, his rule is two out of three wins, if you have the Rambam and the Rif agreeing, which is 99% of the time, then that's the halakha that you're going to have. And that's what he decides. However, the Ramah says very tellingly, he says, Haga, ve'ashkenazim ena noagin lasoda tzitzit rak levanim. That the custom of Ashkenazim is only to make tzitziot that are white. And I doubt that anyone here, aside from Tachelet wearing uh, people, have ever seen any tzitziot a different color. Have you? Uh, yeah, we have a guy in the shul. Not yeah, but he doesn't have the strings or not different uh, color. They, they're not... The talit they is. They think they match the color of the Oh, do they really? The I never noticed. Could be af bebegadim tzvoim ve'en leshanot. So he goes like the opinion... That was a common thing that a lot of the summer camps used to do. Many, like 30 years. Tie-dye uh, tzitziot. You know, they would go to... Um, uh, Manufacturers of mm-hmm. cloth, and the, the kids would learn how to make a talit and a tzitzit, and they make it. They would make it from the color of the material. That's cool. So, so what the Rambam? So, so basically, the Shulchan Aruch holds like the Rambam. He says that if you wear a colored talit, but again, it means shikula aduma, that it's primarily, it's almost all that color. Then you make it in accordance with the color. If it's multicolored, I guess there's no real one color that you would identify it as. If it's white and has a stripe or two, again, the primary color is white. So we wear all white. Uh, maybe as a hidur, you know, a hidur of the, in the Rambam, but really it seems like the Rambam would say that even a white talit with a stripe is still good. Um, it, that's what it seems like to me. Um, so the, so some of the interpretations though say that it's zekeli vehu, that if a, that the, the reason for matching it is because it's more beautiful, so then it kind of makes sense that white on white looks very beautiful, and it's a hidur mitzvah to make it look beautiful, to make it all white. Um, but th- So you have opinions that say that it's required, that the color has to match. And then there's the opinion that says no, that in the end, it doesn't have to match. And you always use white tzitzit, even if you have an all-green talit or an all-blue talit, I'm, or I'm sorry, or an all-red uh, talit. And that's what the Ramah brings. The Tosafot says that, and the Rosh says that. And that's why some opinions tried to interpret the Rambam to side with them, because they wanted him on their side. Uh, the Beit Yosef says, no, no, no. Really, you should make it that way. And he says that he saw people wearing, uh, wearing talitot like that. Now, the last talachas, Ivav, yesh omrim, she'en la'asot talit shel pishtan, so he says there are some who say that you shouldn't make a talit shel pishtan at all. And there's a very interesting historical thing I'm going to bring to you from the Beit Yosef on this. He says there are some people that say, and we mentioned this, this is Rabbeinu Tam. Rabbeinu Tam says don't make a talit of pishtan. Don't make it. What's the reason? Uh, because you don't want to end up with shatnes problems, right? Ve'af al pish en ken. Even though this is not the halacha, because the Rambam very clearly says you can have a talit of linen with linen tzitziot, just not techelet. Okay? He says that you might think to yourself, I want to fulfill the mitzvah of, of uh, tzitzit according to the Rambam's view on the biblical level. So what do I need to use? Either a garment of wool or a garment of linen. If I go with a garment of linen, there are some rishonim that say not to put tzitzit in it at all. So even though I'm fulfilling the Rambam's view, I'm not fulfilling that view. So if you want to, the only way you can fulfill the mitzvah according to all views is to have a wool talit with wool tzitziot. And that's why most people who try to be careful about getting a talit that fulfills the mitzvah according to all will seek after a wool talit with wool tzitziot. And even their talit katan, even the small talit, talitot, should be wool, if possible, because you want to fulfill the mitzvah according to the ideal. And this comes from the Shulchan Aruch. Now, he brings a fascinating uh, historical point here, that the Rosh, has a, uh, the Rosh was an Ashkenazic rabbi who, who led the Sephardic community for some time. 
and uh, he writes in a tshuva, he writes in one of his responsa that when he that uh, that the custom in Ashkenazic countries was not to make a talit of linen. Okay? He says, But when I came to this land, this is the Rosh speaking, Everyone was wearing a talit of pishtan. What's going on here? My heart told me, If I tell them they can't wear a talit of pishtan, according to the Ashkenazi custom, because he was Ashkenazi. He said, if I impose my Ashkenazi custom on these guys and tell them, no, 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 only wool, no linen, they're not going to do the mitzvah. Because they didn't have readily available uh, wool talitot back then. And I said, leave them alone. Because they're leaning on a big, they're hanging from a big tree. That doesn't mean in, the, in, a, bad, in a bad way. It means that they have the Rambam, uh, the Rif, to rely on, right? Shematiro ve'od... Af the perush Rabbeinu Tam, and even according to Rabbeinu Tam's view, en leosro bazmanazeh, we don't have to be careful not to have a uh, talit of linen nowadays. The ikar tam aisur hu dilma atel lemirme betechilat, because what was the original reason why they prohibited having? Linen talitot. It was because we were worried that somebody would put the wool string of blue. Okay, so he basically says that nowadays the reasoning behind uh, Rabbeinu Tam's uh, idea, he would have wanted, in other words, to uphold the Gezerah of Rabbeinu Tam and not to have any talitot of, of linen and not to put any tzitziot in it. But he didn't want to do that because he said that that would cause the people not to follow the mitzvah of tzitzit at all. And moreover, he said that the reason behind the original Gezerah of Rabbeinu Tam was to uh, prevent people from putting the wool string into the linen talit, because maybe they'll be wearing it at night, they'll forget that they're wearing a linen talit with a uh, wool tzitzit, and they're going to violate the commandment of Shatnez inadvertently. So he says, we don't really have techelet today, so we don't have this problem anyway, so that's why I didn't impose this practice upon the Sfaradim. So you see that this was a common practice in Ashkenazic Europe, and, but among the Sfaradim, wearing a talit with uh, linen tzitziot was considered to be okay. A linen talit with linen tzitziot was considered to be okay. However, the Shulchan Aruch does advise. Has to do with wool what? as well. Like there's something I know there's something in. Uh, it might be in Halakha which says that you cannot mix wool and linen. That's what we're talking about. Together. Yeah, that's what that, that's the reason. Yeah, that was the original reason. So um, and the, so the Sephardic custom was advises us to pick a wool talit. And the Ramah concludes, This is exactly what the Rosh says. Better that a person, even though it's ideal to have a wool, t- wool talit with wool tzitziot, better to have a linen talit with linen tzitziot than to lose out on the mitzvah altogether. But nowadays, Baruch Hashem, we're very fortunate. It's readily available. Actually, I don't think you can even find a linen talit anymore. You can certainly find a wool talit. That's the ideal way to fulfill the mitzvah. Have a great day and great evening.